Welcome to episode 83 of the World Builders Anvil. I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram, and here with the co-host, Michael Miller. How you doing, guys? And today's topic is how to build a fantasy culture, but drac Or but drac in in Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place that will help prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builders Anvil. I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram. Let's sup from the mug of Java and build. Okay, welcome back. And um, sort of the way I want to take this episode is... I believe it's probably going to take uh, a few episodes at least to cover this. And there have been some other episodes where I've talked bits and pieces about the culture. Not the culture specifically, but about a, a, king, a kingdom that is historical, historically related called the Kingdom of Bedrakis. And I talked about uh, Bedrakum Carver Magic and uh, Kyrick, um Spirit Magic. And there will be links to those in the show notes for this very episode as well uh, to give you some depth there. And I, I won't go into huge detail about any of those because of those episodes. So it seems to me a good chunk of the show is not only teaching people how to take advantage of what you've learned by building world and worlds and, you know, uh, fiction and what have you, but you just to catalog your own fiction. Um, in the context of the world side of it. So essentially, you know, it's easy, you know, it's one thing to talk about abstractly how to build cultures or how to, uh, build geography, but, mm-hmm. it, you know, it, it's, a, you know, more solid when you can go over an example of something. And I, I've done some things that have been, uh, not part of my world. Uh, right before you came on, I did a series on creating an ant race, uh, which I had no ant race in my world. Um, like like ascension ant race. ascension ant race. okay, and then obviously the, the bug one that you were in right on as well too, as opposed to an ant race, where, like when you put a bunch of ants on a track and bet on it. <laughs> uh, that one, it's, it takes a lot less time than a horse race, but it's not quite as exciting. Well, a marathon could be longer. <laughs> it's ooh six feet. <laughs> I know. Okay, no, you're going twenty six miles today, guys. Move it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so. Um, and it just seems easy. Oh, you mean a literal marathon for ants? Yes. Oh, yes. I don't think they're covering 26 miles in a day. Taste. Uh, unless it is a race of ants in an ant race. <laughs> <laughs> and then they might be able to, but. Probably. Actually, I did get popular. I did get feedback from people who asked for more episodes like that. So I'm doing. Like more race episodes? Um, well, I think it was more because I was doing something specific from. Essentially, the first 50 episodes is really the framework. And if you go and uh, join the newsletter at Garduel.com, there are signups for a newsletter and a pop-up box on the sidebar. And there's a navigation as well to the newsletter. And if you go to any of those spots, um, uh, one of the free giveaways is actually the mind map, talking about maps, uh, for uh, the things I think about when I'm world building. And, uh, is that that is this map that I have right here? That is that map okay. you have right there, and those are sort of the the, the things that I talk about in the first 50, 50 episodes in general fashion. Do you want me to read this real quick? Um, maybe just just a quick note. So a couple notes. It's, so it's basically a uh, calling it a map is really just a choice of word. Like if you were just to show this to me and say what is this, I would call it a chart. It's a I, mind I, map. I would call it a, a, a free form chart of organizing how to create the world. So in the center, it says fantasy world. And then from there, it's almost like trees. You've got a bunch of branches off and it, it, it gives a skeletal structure of the entire fantasy world of what you need to build, such as the rules, magic places, uh, states. And then within each one of those, there's more branches that like further get more specific on every one of those things. So, and so essentially that was my guide to the first 50 episodes. And, and those are the sort of general things I look at when I'm developing a world. Okay. Obviously, a lot of those things are sort of repeated, uh, depending on the amount of the world you develop. Like if you have 
722 cultures. <laughs> uh, you have to. You, you don't have that many. You don't have that many cultures. Uh, the world probably it's, does. It's possible. Yeah, the world realistically probably might. Allow me to ask a more specific question. Mm-hmm. At any given point in time, how many do you think there are roughly? Because I would imagine if you're going to include the entire world's history, then sure, the, the number of cultures that may pop up and, and, and disappear is infinite. But at any uh, one given time, at how any many one given time, roughly cultures. I don't know because I have certain parts of the world that are he- more heavily developed than others, and it depends on where you want to sl- slash that label of what it means. Mm-hmm. Uh, because really, like the Bedrakan culture we'll talk about today is what I call a proto culture. Um, it was sort of a base culture that developed into other cultures along the way. Okay. Is that is that is that like an actual term or is that your term? That's an actual term. I, was like, say, I thought that was like an the, the term. Indo-European would be a, a proto. Um, a, a proto culture where essentially most of the Indo European, uh, uh, they have tiebacks culturally way back to sort of be, way prehistory, mm-hmm. uh, where the Indo Europeans were. And then, like, uh, uh, you know, larger cultural groups, like, you know, you might say Semitic cultural groups would be another proto group where you have, uh, you know, essentially, uh, uh, Hebrews and Arabs and, a lot of the Middle Eastern people are part of this, the Semitic um, uh, cultural group. And, um, you know, uh, Chinese is really much larger than one ethnic group. Right, right. So uh, it kind of depends how you break it down. Well, he's Asian. Yeah. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Well, he could be Chinese or Indian mm-hmm. or, you know, <laughs> it's a very it, generic term. Exactly, too. And in a way, protoculture is kind of misleading, too, because, like, once again, you could argue the Norse culture was a protoculture for for the different Scandinavian cultures that came out of it, the right. Danes, the Swedes, the Norwegians. So, you know, you know, it's sort of like this thing that over time breaks down because as cultural group, groups migrate and they start settling in slightly different areas, uh, depending on their ability to communicate back and forth, you know, the foods might change just a little bit because on this side of the mountain range, maybe fishing's more accessible when the other side it's farming. And so subtle, subtle yeah. differences will change the cultures and develop new cultures over time. So really, as time goes on, you see more. And then with wars and fighting and cultures invading different areas, you know, you'll, you know, even the successor cultures are, aren't really the same as they were before because they will adopt some of the things from the cultures of the area they've conquered, of course. Or if they lose, the fact that they invaded <clears throat> will have impact on the people who held the ground. Uh, so. I mean, you see, I mean, the easy, quick example that I think of with that is just the, all the, the, the Latin nations in South America mm-hmm. coming from Spain. And then, exactly. you know, you know Mexi- Mexican culture is different than, you know, uh, Portuguese, which is different than Spain, but they're all, mm-hmm. you know, and there's pro- Spain. And, and you figure there's Basque in Spain, there's Castilian. Castilian, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I think since the Middle Ages, probably non Basque culture, uh, I think Castilian and the Aragonian are probably much more similar than before, but they were used to be distinct cultures. Uh, but now, you know, it's pretty much Spanish and Basque, I think. And that's an oversimplification. Have you considered having a secondary show that's just a history show? Like, yes, I totally do that. I've also thought of having show, shows where I just talk about food I like, too, uh, because I'm told I make people hungry, <laughs> um, which I think is a good thing. We could do that on my show. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that'd be a, a good time. That'd be a good life episode. <laughs> but yeah, no, there's, there's there's a lot of neat things. So one, it kind of depends on how you want to cut it down and, and, and really how much time you have because there aren't as many cultures as there should be in my world if it's truly natural. And that's one of those areas where you kind of have to cut a line and say, you know what? Because you haven't created them all? Because I haven't, one, I haven't been, I don't have the time to create yeah, them. Yeah, who does? That's what I was going to say. And, and so over time, new cultures are going to show up. So I can't even say for any one time period how many cultures there are in my world because I've never developed them all for any one time period. In this part of the world where I spend a lot more time creating, there are a lot more cultures than once you leave this part of the world. So to get in a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about the inspiration behind this culture. And it'll be very similar if you... The Bedr- Dragon culture. The Bedrakan okay. culture. Thank you very much. And, and once again, it's a, it's a prototype culture that over time... Uh, breaks into a few cultures that are very similar related and then one uh, distinctive branch culture. Um, and we'll talk about that as we sort of get to it. 
And, uh, but one, it's sort of the old German tribes, the pre, um, the, 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 the pre fall of the Roman Empire German tribes. So, um, think about one of the most famous battles in history is probably the Battle of the Teutonburg Forest. I never even heard of that. Ah, well, uh, um, <laughs> I'm not, you know, I'm not as yeah. history so, learned as you are. Essentially, ha- have you ever seen I Claudius? No. Okay. All right. It's an old BBC series about uh, the Julii family and sort of it's supposedly from the perspective of the Emperor Claudius, C- C- Claudius, as he would have been called, because he stuttered, he stuttered. and was lame. And um, it, people were shocked, actually, when he became emperor. Um, there's actually historic evidence of that. And well, well, I mean, was he a smart guy? Was he a good leader? Uh, he is actually, outside of Augustus, probably considered the... Uh, uh, him and Augustus are probably considered the only two Julii uh, emperors that were uh, not crazy um, and actually effective and, and had a lot of good reforms. Okay, so. Uh, so he was much more effective. And some people also wondered, too, if part of his historical remembrance was a PR thing he did to help survive during Tiberius. I'm and sorry, a, a PR thing? Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. So public so, relations thing that he yeah, did to... to survive the reigns of Tiberius and oh, Caligula, who uh, was mm-hmm. emperor before mm-hmm. him. Yeah, of course. Who doesn't know Caligula? Caligula. And then, uh, obviously, uh, his, I believe it was his son, or maybe it was his stepson, um, Nero, was the last of Nero. the Julii. And um, and Nero and Caligula did very badly. And after Nero, the Julii were done as emperors. Um, but there's this battle where Rome is slowly... Gra- putting the fist down in, in what they called Greater Germany, which was across the Rhine. Um, Julius Caesar was the first to get there. He builds a giant bridge to do it. And he marches his legion across. And according to his letters, and so it's kind of hard to know if it's true or not, several hundred thousand Germans watched him build this bridge across the Rhine. Uh, he marched his troops across, uh, took some dirt, and uh, did a few little things right around the bridge, went back across and destroyed it. Just to prove the fact that Rome can cross this giant river, you cannot. So he, he built the bridge solely for the purpose to go over there, push some dirt around, and then walk back to, to say, yes. look, I can, I can do this amazing thing for a small purpose just because I feel like it, and you may not. And you may not, and it's considered one of the greatest art... Engineering feats of all time at, at the time, or still uh, of all time, just because the time the period of which level. he did it, and with the technology that they had, the fact that he could very quickly put a bridge together across a, a, a major river and be able to march his legion across this, set up on the other side just long enough to say hello, and then march back and and without any thought or care, this huge engineering feat, even to the Romans, was impressive. You know, he then just took it down. Like, I, I'll, if I need it again, I'll put it wherever I need to on this river. I'll, I'll, I, can, I can come back and forth as I will. I don't need boats. Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, and it was a way to say, because the Germans would come across the Rhine in small boats, and they mm-hmm. would raid into their little Roman villas and villages, and they would run back. And it was to say that we can be here if we want to. And from the time of Julius, uh, 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 Rome actually built a major fortification on the Rhine with a more permanent bridge across it. And, um, and, and a, a big massive fort would set on the Roman side. And, and then they had, a, they would send in legions annually during the summer, uh, or in the spring to set up camp in, in what they called Greater Germany. And it was just the way Rome's here. We're not doing much. And, and they're working with the local leaders. They're, they're trying to bring the influence of Rome down permanently on Germany. And so during Augustus's reign, um, some of the legions had crossed as per normal. I believe it was two legions every year were going across. How big is a legion? A legion varies in size, but uh, in size, but probably about like somewhere about eight to twelve thousand. Oh, jeez. Uh, yeah. So you, yeah, so, a whole ton. A whole ton, but I mean, not nearly as large as like the number of Germans in the area. Okay. Uh, but it was to say, one, this is all we need. And, uh, but two, how, how did, how did, how did their armies, uh, 
compare. I mean, I, I mean, obviously the Romans had very well trained soldiers. They had very well trained soldiers. They were reputed to be able to act without a competent leader because the legions were trained so well. Uh, the flaw of the legion really ended up being that uh, they needed to be trained well to fight the way they fought. And so losing a legion is a very bad thing because it takes, I, th- I think, seven years to properly train a legion. Okay. And, but once they're properly trained, they build roads, they build, uh, bath works, uh, they occupy regions. They're, mm-hmm. they're an amazing amalgamation of skills. Um, but and, to go back to my original question, mm-hmm. how did that fighting force compare to those overwhelming numbers that you said the Germans had on the other side mm-hmm. of the Rhine? So the Germans typically had a lot of light infantry. Uh, so, uh, not very heavily armored, uh, decent, good weapons. Uh, probably comparable weapons. Mm-hmm. And there's some argument, I think, back and forth on the quality, but... Of the weapons or the... Of the weapons. The skills. Um, uh, the, the skills, not so much, but the weapon quality, I, I think, is more of a contested topic on whether or not... Some people say uh, that Rome was actually not a great iron smithing culture. And others would say, you know, comparable, and others would say better. So it's one of those three. And, uh, <laughs> it's, one of those, it's one of those arguable three. Yeah, it's one of those arguable three. And so what would happen is the Romans um, went in uh, with their two legions as they were doing annually at the time. And one of the, they would create an, an auxiliary force of local nobles. So what they would do is they would take locals from the area. They would send them back to Rome, educate them and teach them in their ways. And they would act as uh, the cavalry for the uh, Roman legions. And one of the auxiliary guys actually was plotting on Rome. So, so it's a German soldier that they're sending to Rome to train. It, I, I'm assuming with the plan of like pseudo conscription, like they're tr- kind of slowly, like you know, pulling well, him into the Roman faction and thus assimilating the culture. Exactly, that's exactly the plan. Is you take the children of the nobles who support you back to Rome, away from the nobles who support you. And in theory, they'll be less willing to act against you because it's the whole idea that you hear a lot in, in, in like, European, uh, uh, you know, exchanging hostages with your uh, allies. And, um, and uh, you're less likely to act against me if your son is being educated in my city. Yeah, and that educated is coming with air quotes because you guys can't see Yes, that. you guys can't actually see the air quotes, but the idea being they're, they're trying to Romanize the local uh, mm-hmm. leaders and then when their father dies, a Roman version of, of him son goes back. Goes back yeah. But the problem, and, and, and supposedly, and I forget the name of, of this German, and I apologize, but, uh, was actually in awe of the achievements in Rome. And, but from the historians I've read about this, he actually kind of wanted to create his own version of the Roman Empire, but from Germany. And so, he he's somehow communicating back and forth with some of the leaders, trying to get them to attack Rome. And what happens is uh, his force, as they're marching back, goes off to uh, scout out for the um, for the legion, and they start attacking and burning some of the watchtowers along the way. They start seeing that, and they end up driving the Roman legions into the the thick forest of Germany, and. The Roman soldiers didn't like the forest of Germany because in the Mediterranean, you don't have these big, thick forests with giant trees. It was, it, 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 it was a intimidating and foreign environment. A foreign environment. They couldn't build roads through them the way they were used to. It's like they had roads all along the rivers, but, uh, going into the forest was a completely alien environment that they weren't even used to fighting. In. And when they pulled them off far enough, all of a sudden, the Germans who he had got to fight the Romans started coming out and attacking the middle part, and then they would retreat, attacking the rear of the, the column and retreating. And so throughout this whole force, the Romans are just trying to get, get out of the force now, and they're having now massive amounts of uh, Germans coming in and attacking them. And then after a while, they end up trying to make a break for it, and they end up getting corralled up by some hills in the Teutonburg Forest and slaughtered. And Augustus lost his eagles, which would sit at the top of all of the standards of the Roman legions, and which really made him mad. Uh, is this uh, like is this like uh, uh, 
some sort of idol, or are you literally talking about an actual living eagle? Exactly. So on the top of the Roman standards for their units, they would have golden eagles. Okay. So. And sometimes there were different symbols too, but that was like the standard one, was like the eagle in the time of Augustus. I think and there's a movie about that called the, I think it's called the eagle or something like that. And it's about, it, th- there might be, cause this is a very formative thing. And this was not new in Roman tactics. Uh, during Julius Caesar's, uh, rise to power, uh, he had his eagles taken. Mm-hmm. And did you ever see, uh, the Rome, uh, I think it was a showtime. No, the, the, the documentary they did yeah. about it. I have access to it. I just, it's, I literally I watch just it at some point. It I have heard it's amazing. And one of the interesting things is too, those are the only two plebeians, commoners, the, the two main characters of that show, if I, who were ever written about in Julius Caesar's, um, those were the two stars it's about are plebes. They were actually mentioned multiple times in Julius Caesar's memoirs. And they're the only plebes that were ever mentioned. That's a big deal. Yeah. To have, to have a. <laughs> so I think it's Polo and, um, I can't remember that. I'm so good with names. If I wanted to, uh, just buy that outright for myself, what mm-hmm. would be the best way to do that? Gee, um, I would, I would think, you know, and I do own this. And what I, I, I can't do it because I own Garduel.com, but he wants to go to Garduel.com slash Amazon and they would be able to go there. You could order Rome. It's, it's a historical fiction, uh, uh, during, uh, the rise of Julius Caesar and, and, and through Augustus, uh, rise to power and, uh, two seasons, uh, tremendous, tremendous show. So it's, a, so it's a TV show. I thought it was more of a documentary. No, it, it's, it's actually, actually a it, it's a historical drama. Okay. I didn't know uh, that. Yeah. And, uh, so you said www. Garduel.com slash Amazon. That is correct. Okay. And that'll just take me right to Amazon. Amazon. And I believe you also say for if you belong to Amazon Prime, um, if, or if you don't, I believe Amazon Prime, at least they used to have it as something you could watch, uh, through Amazon Prime as well, which is another good thing to get from Amazon while you're there. Because have you heard of Prime Day? No. They're adding, I think it's July 15th. They're going to have a bigger version of of Cyber Monday in July for Amazon Prime members. So, so, so the day after this episode airs. Actually, I don't know. I, if I, it's, hope, if I it's, hope so. If it's July fifteenth, this the show is going to air after that. So this this so for next year. <laughs> yes. So for next year, make sure to join Amazon Prime. Yeah, and get on to because this will Prime. be bigger than Cyber Monday for Amazon. That's cool. But it's just a cool thing to know, too. And it's also, like I said, you get free ebooks, you get free streaming video. It's a good complement to a service like Hulu or mm-hmm. uh, Netflix. Uh, a lot of people I know who have Amazon Prime you usually have a Netflix or a Hulu along with yeah. you, too. But I could keep you talking about Rome. This all the time. All day. Yes, we could have a whole episode so, on Rome. As much as I am enjoying it, and I do want to. Keep, cause it's actually reminding me of a couple other things that I wouldn't mind talking about, but I want, I don't want to segue you too far. How does that battle, which is what you were okay. originally focusing on, relate to the Draken culture? Is that battle gotten interested in these German cultures who are up there? And these German cultures who then later on, due to forced migrations in Asia, uh, with essentially the Mongols fighting the Huns, pushing the Huns to the west, which pushed the Magyars to the west, which pushed uh, more tribes to the west, which started ramming against the Germans at the end of the empire, started pushing them across the border. Um, and they would actually become Romanized. Uh, I was about to say, which border? The Roman border? The Roman border. Okay. And so groups like the Franks, maybe you've heard of the Franks, um, Charlemagne. Charlemagne, okay, yes. yeah, yeah. Um, it, uh, the Franks were one of these groups. And, and it, it, it led me to do a lot of study of what they called the dramatic people. And, uh, and the Franks being an interesting one because they didn't call themselves the Franks. Other people called them the Franks because of the weapon they carried. Uh, the, uh, Frank, Francesca axe. Essentially, it's a long axe. You can throw it. If it hits the ground without a person, it will typically bounce and spin. Uh, it was a very effective weapon. A lot of people think it actually, uh, was one of the reasons why Charlemagne did so well. And, and the Franks went from this obscure small tribe of people in Gaul 
to uh, creating West and East Francia, which uh, became oh Germany and France. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and and brought Christianity really to Central and Western Europe by not the blade of a sword, but the blade of an axe. But uh, it was sort of those ideas of of the way sort of cultures sort of mutate and and change. And these guys who were so anti Roman uh, would end up becoming allies of Rome, which would end up kind of replacing Rome after Rome fell. And um, and and the idea that they were really identified by their weapons uh, that 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 was one of the, the major ways people identified because that was a signature weapon that only they used, and so they were called the Franks. Um, so do you like just take that? Is it, is that a, a, a quality of uh, the dragon culture? Uh, yes, and like weapon identification, weapon identification. All of the different tribes, all of their names are based off of the weapons. So you have the Lumaten, which are what you would have known as the dragons when we used to play, and their tribe essentially used axes. And uh, there's these Labonians who are who sort of spun off of their culture. Um, when the culture itself is migrating, they start in the central part of Gardul, and uh, the mythology goes that uh, uh, Kunsad, who is the chief old god of the religion, uh, was battling the king of the giants. Uh, and they would be falling back and forth on the planet, which w- w- would cause mountain ranges to rise up. Um, as that war is happening between the giants and the chief god, uh, this god Drak, he he sees the people suffering because they're at the feet of the gods. So he comes down with his great chariot, brings the uh, the Drakan people or the followers of Drak onto his chariot, and he flies them to a safer place, which is what is called the plain of Drak. Um, that's not actually what happened, but that's sort of in their mythology what happened. What really happened was there was a really powerful human tribe south of them called the Ascaric. I don't know how much the periods of time that you played were after they were wiped off of the face of the earth. Uh, however, or wiped off, wiped, wiped, wiped off the face of Gardul. Wiped off the face of Gardul and Earth. They weren't on either place. Neither, neither planet. Like, we haven't seen any of them. Um, however, at that time, they were, they were kind of considered the boogeyman. It's like, the Ascari will come for you if you're a bad person. At the time, uh, prior, your characters were playing. Prior to their death, or you mean after the After their death. So they slid into legend at that point. They, were, they kind of went to legend, and, and they kind of grew out of this Persian culture. So this idea of this massive empire that's spreading all over the world and had really powerful magic. That was their backbone was, was just this, Intense concentration of magic, but as their 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 culture was actually turning into a civilization and starting to grow, a lot of the tribes of orcs and humans that lived around that area started fleeing because they didn't want to be conquered and forced to do what these other people wanted. The Bedrakum, uh they they start <clears throat> migrating as a people. They kind of come up and they invade the arm of the world, which is what I call. Uh, the arm of the world. Yeah, because it's sort of it's this one part of the world that sort of sticks out in the ocean and comes down. It looks kind of like an, an arm. Okay. And on a map. Even though they couldn't see that. So it's more of a peninsula is what we're talking about. Well, yeah, it's a continental-sized peninsula. But it's, oh, so it's... Yeah. Okay, so we're talking a lot of huge... It, it's a huge... It's okay. a huge land, okay. huge land mass. Not as big as, like, Europe, but it's... It's... Big. Big. And um, so they kind of come up there, and then they get followed up by a couple different tribes of orcs, the Ordescent Orcs, which uh, you did have contact with in your game, and the Mountain Orcs, and uh, which you probably did not. And uh, But the Orc campaign I ran was actually based off of that culture. But So it was sort of these migrations that were slamming into each other, uh, being caused by this growth of a power somewhere else in the world. And um, so as that's happening, essentially, it's all of those cultures with the culture, the Syrian culture, who was there first. Uh, all of those cultures kind of coming together, creating the cultures on the continent. And there's actually a battle where uh, some of the people decided that Drak should be the chief god, and he started becoming the chief god for a huge section of the culture because Drak was the person leading them to safety. And there was an old school group, the whom became the Umladen, 
or uh, as you would have known them, the Upsilon, uh, Lord Humongous. Uh, I don't think I remember that. I don't, you don't know that name? I okay. So that, he might not have been around in, in, in one of the campaigns with you, but they're sort of... I think of, I would have remembered the name Lord, Lord Humongous. Humongous. Because obviously that's a homage back to Mad it's Max. A, it sounds like a... <laughs> okay, a Mad Max. I was going to say, yeah, it almost sounds like a Tolkien and, horn and, name. No, and, <laughs> and, and, and the cart, the guy with the big mask. I believe that was Lord Humongous. Okay. So the second uh, movie. Uh, the second one, yeah. Yeah. And um, he... Um, but essentially... Um, they split off. They kept what they considered were the old ways, which really weren't. But, you know, it's all perspective. And the people who followed Drock continued up into the arm. And um, they they settled in a different spot. Those two cultures dramatically shifted to the point where years later when they start interacting again, the language doesn't sound the same. Did, um, was it still relatively the same language? Like, are we talking about a difference between, like, Mexican Spanish and Castilian Spanish? Or are we talking about a difference, like... Portuguese and, and, and Castilian. More like Portuguese and Castilian. Okay. Where, where they uh, can't quite talk to each other. Or, 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 Sa- or, or Saxon versus Nor, Nor, uh, Norse. You know, it's like. Italian versus Spanish? Italian, well. Because they the, can kind of communicate. The difference is Italian is technically a Spanish Creole. So essentially you had Latin speakers and then the Franks invaded down into Italy. And so you had sort of this uh, Frank version of Latin, uh, which was being spoke. Then later on in like the 15th century, the Spanish conquered large swaths of, of Italy. And at time, the language itself is actually considered a Creole of Spanish and Latin, I believe. Hmm. Or maybe Spanish and French, I'm not sure. But it's actually, so it's, it's actually even closer to Spanish than what like, like Italian to French would be. So, so that one example isn't quite as good because Italian really kind of was came heavily from, influenced. It came from it, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but this is more like you have a same language to hear and then there's a fork. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's like an Android versus another Linux distribution that forked off. So, um, so, uh, there are different languages at the point, uh, but there might, there are probably common roots and certain things in there if you can get past. It. Did those two cultures? Because at that point, I'm calling them two cultures. Yes, so at that point, that, that's for, now for, that's the first real culture who peeled off for, for for all of the time they spent separated, and now they're kind of reconverging and like interacting. Mm-hmm. Did they consider themselves a heritage of each other? No, no, they're just you're a totally different culture. Yeah, they had no idea. Oh, they didn't even know. Yeah, they didn't even know. Okay, no they, written history. Uh, in, in their mythology, there are the people who betrayed on both sides, <laughs> but they don't know that these are the people. Okay. You know, because they So don't, they know of a people that splintered off. You know, who betrayed the gods, betrayed the old ways. But and, they and, don't realize that they're the one who are in their old stories. A, exactly. Exactly. So it was that long between the communication coming back together. And, uh, and then... Be, beyond these uh, sort of German tribes and, you know, which I kind of got to because of learning about the Battle of the Teutonberg Forest and, 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 and this idea of cultures being forced and moved uh, by other cultures' dominance, um, you know, the other thing would be, you know, what happens if you start putting magic into these cultures? Because obviously uh, there isn't magic, you know, or at least we don't think there is. Maybe there is and we don't know. Who knows? I can't know what I don't know, so I don't know there isn't magic, but I don't think there is, so I'm going off that conclusion. Gotcha. At least not the way it's made up in my mind. Not And certainly not the way it shows up in Garduel. And certainly not the way it shows up in Garduel. Um, so the idea is, once I start putting magic back into these cultures, how do they develop? And one of the things that, you know, one of the conclusions I came to there is, uh, magic in fantasy usually has the wrong focus. It's about spells that, you know, cause fireballs and magic missiles. And well, you're talking about in games, though, yeah? Or are you talking, like, in stories? In, 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 in most fantasy stories, you know, it's subtle, but it's still, it's, it's Gandalf blinding the people so the charge can work, but it's mm-hmm. subtle. But still, it's like the focus of magic is, are these big effects that, you know, help shape, you know, battles and countries being formed. Where in, in, Guard, and especially in the Bedrakan culture, the focus of magic, 95% of people who use magic 
are worried about farms. Yeah, it's all practical uses. Yeah. Practical applications. Exactly. But the good thing is because of that is your farms can produce more food than they should be able to without it. So you actually get a higher yield of food than what you could get without magic. So you start seeing larger population builds uh, faster. So, you know, in the Iron Age uh, kingdom of uh, Gerbaldus, you actually have larger populations more equivalent to what you might see in the Roman Empire on Earth compared to like places like Germany were vastly, you know, much larger. You know, like the city of Rome had about a million people in it in its heyday uh, before the fall of the empire. And I believe they said it didn't re-reach a million people until 1960. Wow. Yeah. And at that point, too, it was in a much larger look. It had a much larger landmass yeah, than it, it had did. More geography. Yeah. yeah. So, what is the influence of magic going to be, you know, upon ancient cultures? Because that's going to help them shape as much as any of the other inspirations you have. And and, and for me, with Bedrachim, a lot, uh, dr- the the god Drac is about protection and and family. And um, and what, what is the exact? Uh, yeah, protection, poetry, and hearth. So essentially your home, protection, you know, and, and that sort of leads them to start going to this idea of, you know, more walled cities. Uh, you know, you, you work to protect what you have. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is an expansionism about, about them, but it's slower than what other countries might have because the idea is when they come in, they come in and they build these things to place troops into which they can then control the area. So it was like, when England took over Wales, they built a series of castles around the edge of Wales. And then when the, the Welsh tried to act up, they would send their troops out from the castle and smack them around and they would go back to the castle. Aha, uh-huh, have a nice day. Uh, so it's this defense, to, but really it's defensively minded, but it's really offensive castles. And people typically think of castles the other way, like mm-hmm. you hide behind these walls. Uh, which is a really bad castle tactic because mm-hmm. you will starve at some yeah, point. Yeah, you'll starve out, yeah. Um, the idea of the castle was it's big enough that we can bring a relief force here before you can take us. And if you go past us, we'll be able to send men out to harass your supply lines. So they become these offensive threats, but they take longer to build. So it, the expansion of, the, of of this country is much slower compared to some of the other countries around it because of this religious belief that came up around their god rock. So, just to clarify, it seems like a lot of your culture-building approach is take an Earth-based culture, throw it through the Jeffrey Ingram, you know, process, mind spin. Mm-hmm. You're going to think about it. You're going to adjust it a little bit. You're going you're gonna to put it in a different geography and add magic to see what would change what would develop in that culture with that advantage Mm -hmm. you know or advantages i think advantage is an appropriate word there but i think it's not i call them traits okay trait i like that i like that better exactly you know and uh what are are the impacts you know and especially too because you know once you deviate the culture or, or the belief that you take or the idea that you take you start deviating it once the point you start that process it could end somewhere completely different than what you expect. Mm. And uh, some of my cultures have done that. Other ones have ended up differently, um, you know, where they seem more similar to the origins they came from. Um, and a lot of that I get is probably about how much inspiration gets brought across with it. But, you know, it's kind of like if you play that, if you play a video game where it's like, you know, civilization where you start off and here's the world and you're trying to conquer the world, you know, once you hit that play button, history's, different. You know, so the game like Civilization, it's from the beginning. There's another game I like called Crusader Kings 2. Um, these are all computer games. Uh, these are computer games. Uh, which is sort of like this dynasty ruling simulator, I guess is the best way to describe it. It's a, it's like a Steam game. I don't know if you can play it without Steam. But, um, but you know, it starts off at a period of time in, in history of Europe, India, or the Middle East, and and then the games go, you know. So it's like if you have all the expansions, you can start back at the time of Charlemagne, all the way through the Mongol invasions, basically of of Europe. And but once you hit play, you're creating a new history. 
Ukrainian history. And subsubsequently different cultures. Yeah, and, and, and I don't think it really goes to that degree in this game. However, you can change the cultural composition of the world. If you take the Byzantine Empire and you start re-expanding it out and recapturing the glories of the Roman Empire and reestablishing it, you're actually re- replacing uh, Italians with Greek culture people over time, mm-hmm. um, depending on the rulers and stuff like that. But if the Greeks are at the top of the empire, that culture will slowly spread out through its domain. I had a, a funny realization because I had, I had uh, texted you earlier about um, today's show topic, uh, and I had realized that on the drive over that I actually created a culture in your world. Or, well, uh, maybe microculture is probably yeah. a little more mm-hmm. appropriate. Has, yeah. anyone, has anybody else done that? Am I the only one? I I think Chris Fairbanks may have. Was doing sort of, had a sort of a similar idea, if I remember correctly. I, 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 he almost wanted to be a different race, and I think I, I wouldn't allow that. Mm-hmm. Um, but essentially, he wanted sort of these, he wanted sort of these Scottish style, uh, Syrian people, which wasn't really relevant, mm-hmm. uh, to the world, but I sort of, I picked a sort of lousy spot for him. And, uh, like, I, I, like la- you gave him a lousy ge- geographical area. Yeah. Okay. You know, hilly. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, where something like that, like that might exist or whatever. So, uh, so I would say, I would say so. If I remember correctly, because I'm trying to remember this now, I think it was like an island somewhere. Yes. It was, it was an island not too far away from, uh, High Wall, which what's the real name of High Wall? Kleinfar. Kleinfar. So it's not far from Kleinfar because that was one of their major uh, trade locations because that's a major city, um, and it was a it, <laughs> it was kind of like a cult. I mean, from the outside, they would probably have been perceived as a religious cult, but it was a a peaceful, uh, intellectually based, um, magic focused. Community, I guess we'll call it, because I because yeah. I don't I don't remember physically how large uh, the island was, or subsequently how how large their population. was. I think I, it was relatively small. It was. I know it was small. Um, so you know, maybe we could chalk it up to, I guess, tribe. But they were, but they were learned. You know, they had books. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, uh, it was mandatory that everyone know how to read. Um, everybody learned magic as it was in that culture. But not everyone could use it. So it wasn't, okay, well, if they were called a notion. So it wasn't if, if you're a notion, you can cast spells. That's not true. If you're a notion, you know spells mm-hmm. and you know about magic, but you, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a mage. Um, this was, uh, Yassad's background. This was Yassad's background. And to be honest, I don't remember all the particulars about the culture because it's been so long since I've done anything about it. But what I had basically done is taken, a uh, r- rather strict, actually it's very strict, uh, uh, Christian look uh, at uh, the societal structure, added magic, and also added uh, more of a, a Hindu look to it. So there was a creator, a preserver, and a destroyer in their god system. Mm-hmm. Um, but also the idea of penance was very uh, was a very big thing, and. Um, and that became, I mean, as you know, that became a very big thing with the character. Yes. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, aside to that, I, I think that's probably the only culture I've ever had to create in a, you know, in a game world yeah. or, or anything. I mean, I've, I've, I've certainly made cliques and, and, you know, micro societies, you know, but mostly it's like, oh, they're human or, or like I, I was building a, a shadow run campaign. But again, that, that world exists in an already established world Mm -hmm. and it all stems from a human base. Mm -hmm. So it's not like there were, I mean, yes, there are other races in shadow in shadow run, but uh, they, they evolved from goblinization is what they occurred. Basically Mm -hmm. one day, normal human people started giving birth to dwarves, orcs, uh, trolls, elves, and they're like, what the heck is going on? Mm -hmm. And then those subsequent races started to, pop up and just literally literally <laughs> so uh while there are all these other races those races don't have a strong sense of culture because mm-hmm. the only culture there is is human culture yeah so 
while they start to gain a uh, cultural identity as time goes by, it's still it's still coming off of human culture. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that, that game, you, you didn't quite make it that way. You didn't build your cultures that way. Mm-hmm. So, Okay. Yes. You yeah, know, I, I actually vaguely re- remember... Be, because I think I think you did all that just in coming up with the background for your character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, wasn't necessary. <laughs> it wasn't necessary, but it was a lot of fun. And yeah. I, and actually, um, I know we've we've mentioned Dawn a number of times on the show before, and, and you interviewed her for the show. But uh, Dawn Metcalf and I actually um, we created our characters for this is for the drama. Uh, and you mind me going on this segue? I don't want to hit this segue. Okay. Um, we had created our characters completely independent of each other. Dawn and I actually, but prior to that game, although we had met before and we didn't realize that, um, we weren't like friends. We didn't hang out. Um, so we had created our characters completely independent of each other, but for some reason they lined up like puzzle pieces. Mm-hmm. So they created some incredible synergy for the game and, and it became a real focal point of the story. And she and I actually did side writing on your old website, um, you know, your, your average fictional novel is like 80,000 words, mm-hmm. roughly 50 to, you know, 80, hundred thousand words. Yep. Uh, last time we actually did a word count and mind you, we haven't touched that story in years and years and years, but we had written like 250,000 words together. <laughs> so, I mean, we had done so much of fleshing the characters mm-hmm. out. And in that process, I needed to be thorough with his backstory. So yeah. I, I just, made more and made more and made more until I had this really, really strong backstory that gave the character a much more believable feel. You know, just like when we were talking in the, uh, in the architect, in the, uh, uh, the episode where we, uh, the gardener, the gar- the gardener, the architect and the gunslinger, mm-hmm. this was very much an architect style, you mm-hmm. know, character creation process and creating his culture was, was imperative that it, mm-hmm. it, it, his culture defined his character. Whereas not everyone, I mean, everyone's culture is part of who they are, of course, mm-hmm. but some people might deny their culture or decide to adopt a new one. Yeah. You know, like I was raised in rural Connecticut, yeah. but I moved to New York City and I very much became a New Yorker. I love New York and mm-hmm. I, I would move back to New York. I mm-hmm. love, I loved li- living in the city. Um, so I don't identify with being raised in a small farm town. Yeah. You know, I identify with having lived in the city when I was in my early twenties. Yeah. Um, but with Yassad, he was defined by his upbringing on this mm-hmm. very, very s- strict religious island upbringing. Mm. And, um, well, like, their big thing was with you were saying before about how magic in your world is more practical is what they did is they would, they would do, create, like, magical, whether it be items or whatever, whatever would be helpful. Mm-hmm. And then they would sell that. They would go to the local cities and they yeah. would sell that stuff. And that's one of the big ways they would get tools and, you know, whatever they needed, paper, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever they they needed for their culture back on the island that they couldn't produce on the island themselves, that's how they would, you know, subsidize their needs. Yeah, but especially being an island-based thing, you typically have a limited amount of resources. Of course, yeah, of course. Magic items would be a good way to build up the wealth to afford the stuff to survive. Um, But technically, I think your culture would probably be considered a heresy. (laughs) (laughs) So not just a cult, but a her- flat heresy. But a flat heresy. Was that, is that just because they had their own gods? They had their own. Is that what they made yeah, heresy they're, they're, or, yeah, or the it, magic? Yeah. Like, because what? in that in that time period, there's a more formalized sort of Iron Age version of the Draken paganism, which essentially eliminates most of the gods, and um, and so but deviation from that. It, the problem that religion had versus like. Something like Christianity or Islam on Earth is it never sort of had the the ability to flex its muscles as much as as those other religions did because yeah actually you think about it it was such a small island and such a small community it was kind of like Jonestown yes <laughs> yes but they had this idea of the tribunal which was the three faces of of or the three faces of God which were really three of the older gods merged into one. And, but this is Bedraken, are you talking about? In, in the Bedraken culture. Yeah, Bedrack, okay. And um, and so it's funny that you have the three different things. Yeah, which, the creator, the preserver, and the destroyer, which yeah, I totally stole from other religions. So. Oh, of course, but I mean that's you know it's kind of if you you know I was reading a book on how how to make great languages, and the guys like find an interesting uh, 
syntax and and grammar and come up with sounds for it. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, you know, it's like, it's like the Elvish religion or the Elvish language in token is Latin. Just different sounds. It, 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 a lot of the cases in the language, a lot of the language itself is taken from Latin, but then the sounds were applied to it. And then the nuances and, mm-hmm. you know, but it's really, it's really, you take a core or something that works and, and you, you, you make it what you need. Yeah. You dress it differently. That's right. So for the cultural creation, you know, you pick a culture that's already out there or mishmash some together. Mm-hmm. So we're getting up. I think we're doing, let's see, we haven't got to the goals of the culture yet. Okay. So. <laughs> well, why don't you cover that for a little bit? Yeah, no, we will, we'll cover the goals next. And I think that'll probably be the stopping part for this episode. And uh, yeah. And so essentially, and, and we kind of covered the first one a little bit, but it's to take sort of these ideas and it's vague ideas, you know, from, you know, and when I call it the Germanic tribes, it's, it's, it's really the things today that you would call uh, Gaul and, and Germany uh, back then. And, um, and take the ideas from those during the Roman Empire and, and, and salt it with magic and watch it grow. And then it's this focus on hearth and home. This idea that the most important things in your life revolve around the hearth of your home. And, uh, that, that, that goes back to a lot of Northern European ideas of, um, the Greeks kind of believed in that too, didn't they? Oh, like there's a hearth god in almost every religion. So the idea of the hearth being important is not, is not that shocking, but it's this idea where, you know, it's not just about having and preserving your hearth, but it's about opening it to people. So if strangers come up the road, you let them in your house to eat at your table. You know, it's this idea of hospitality. It, and, and not necessarily always quite the way you think of it today, but the, the irony would be if you would show up to a Viking uh, Jarl's home when he's not out raiding your homeland. <laughs> He would accept he, you to he his didn't table you to, for for dinner, most definitely, and that was something I always found very very interesting too, and and also the idea that like the old Saxons in Germany, the old Saxons in Germany actually elected their leaders, really, uh, their kings were elected, and actually even in the Holy Roman Empire, uh, it was actually the the dukes and counts. I believe it was both levels. If you were count level or higher, you would actually vote on the next emperor. And and was that was that vote the direct? Um, it, it's was called, it was it an, an influential vote or was it the vote like that vote? That vote mattered. That vote mattered. And for periods of time, the pope had a big influence on it, but it waned very quickly. Mm-hmm. And, and you started having troubles between the pope and the emperor. And sometimes there would be a Pope Emperor and a German Emperor, and the German Emperor was really the more important one um, for a long time until Germany really kind of fragmented apart. Um, but um, and the Habs- Habsburgs sort of went their own way, and Austria-Hungary was created. But um, <clears throat> and, so, how, how does this tie into cultural goals? But the idea of it always fascinated me that you, this idea of an elected monarchy. And so I needed a culture who would sort of embrace that idea. And uh, when you get later on into the kingdom of Corbatus, uh, there's no king, even though it's called a kingdom. And the idea that, you know, you have these leaders of all of the different principalities, the princes, them and, 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 and the lords would elect a grand knight. And so what's the dynamic going to be in this world with magic and this non-elected person who sort of is the commander in chief, but that's all he really can do. And which is pretty powerful too. So it's sort of the struggle there. Those are all the things I wanted to explore with this culture. So those are sort of, sort of the goals for this culture is I want to explore those kind of ideas. And, um, and, and next time we'll, we'll get into the, we'll talk a little bit about, about the traits and the language and, and probably go into, um, the next major thing, which would be the sort of history and evolution of, how they started from this tribe at the foot of the uh, worm range um, to this culture up north, and 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 
in the period of time where my first novel will be coming out from. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, we, do you have a name for your first novel? Uh, it's going to be called. Uh, do you want to say? I don't that know yet, if I want to say. Okay, all right, that's fine. Yes, there is a name for it. Okay, cool. and I'll tell you as soon as we stop. <laughs> all right, but and and th- let's start with the first real world task here, and that is start developing a new culture in your world, and and in this come up with what are things that inspire you, and they don't have to be from the same culture. Uh, they could be a mishmash of ideas that you find fascinating from watching documentaries. Or maybe you like lights and you want it. Light is important. It doesn't matter what the inspiration is, but come up with some inspiration and then come up with some goals for your culture and, and, and just write those down. And that is the world-building task for the day. And now for the real-world task for the day, do you have one you want to share? Um, well, some of the ones that I keep thinking of are not, uh, they're not real strong, like, you know, adding to life stuff like i i just i just finished daredevil okay so i oh, got the, oh, the season on netflix the season on netflix i just finished watching it the other night and i just keep thinking about it so i, I kind of want to be like if you haven't watched daredevil even if you are not a comic book person mm-hmm. it is a great show um i do warn anybody i imagine anyone listening to this show probably has a handle on uh consuming violence um it's it's graphic you wouldn't expect that because of the nature of, of, of how it comes at you. But when some of the violence comes up, it comes up pretty strong, mm. you know? And, and it's funny cause it's not like it's, there's a, I don't, I don't know if I want to use the word gory. It's more, uh, gory implied, which is something that ra- like ratings are very specific about when it comes to rating a movie. Um, you can so show somebody getting shot, yeah. but the moment you put blood in there, from the wound, like if you, if, if clearly somebody's been shot and they quickly clutch their chest and they fall, so you know an impact has, has occurred and they fall, mm-hmm. that doesn't, you know, rate high for to go against them for the rating. But when you add the gore of blood, and I just want to add one thing: there's actually a great fight scene. Now, I don't want to give too much away in it, but there must be twenty people he fights in this scene. You see him fight two. And the rest of it's even implied, but you know it's happening. Episode two, the, I ha- believe, the hallway. Yeah, that's where he goes down the hallway. Yeah, he fights. I think it's not twenty. That's a bit it, high. It's more like ten, but it's but it's a solid. It's a solid eight. I think it's eleven actually. It's hard to tell from the way they show the fight, right? But the idea is is there's a lot more violence than what you even see, right? But you feel it. You feel it. That's what's good. It's a to to quote um uh to quote um. Uh, Cliff Blazinski of uh, of uh, Gears of War, he likes the word crunchy when mm. he talks about the violence in his games. And and when the violence starts picking up in Daredevil, it's it's crunchy. Mm. You feel it. And yeah. It's, it's like I said, it's not even like that they show you everything. Yeah. But even like there's a couple things that occur that are very, very mm. gory. They don't show you all of it. They show yeah. you some of it. Yeah. But because of the sound engineering and the sound effects and it's it's unsettling. Yeah. So, and one of the things I actually I appreciate about the violence in there, and this is one thing that doesn't get covered a lot typically. People think like people can fight forever, and, oh, yeah. and it's like you have you have the classic uh, sword fight with you know Conan the Barbarian versus I don't know eighty guys, yeah. eighty guys, and he just tears through them, and you're like, wow, that's so cool. And he doesn't slow; he picks up steam as he goes on. Mm. This show doesn't break. Even good. like you know any kung, almost any kung fu movie. Yeah, yeah. You have two people who are having a kung fu battle that lasts for thirty minutes. Yeah, and and it's just this beautiful choreographed thing, which in itself is I, I enjoy that too. Yeah, I got nothing against it, but it's not realistic. But for a person who has experienced violence in their life, violence is a short See, flash. That's a, it surprises me that you say that, and you kind of chuckled to yourself as you said that because I know you don't revere that. No. So it kind of surprised me that you even smiled a little when you said that. Oh, I laugh because I'm admitting that I'm saying this thing which I don't revere. Okay. So I'm laughing at myself when I'm Okay. Laughing. I just want to make sure that the appropriate emotion was tied to your statement because it didn't sound or look like the emotion that you no. meant. Okay. Yes, no, but the thing is, it, it, it's short, it's gritty, it's fast, and very quickly fatigue would set, and especially if you're in hand-to-hand fighting with someone. Obviously, if you're using weapons or whatever, it can extend that if they're not hand-to-hand weapons, you know, like 
firearms or bows and arrows or whatever. But and regardless of the actual combat, adrenaline takes a gigantic toll yes. on the body. And when so adrenaline then, is gone, you're done. You're done. Yeah. You're done. And I think the statement that you hadn't quite completed is that in Daredevil, mm-hmm. you see him get so tired in almost all of the fights. And like, he is an, one of the amazing things with his character is his character is a way to pull himself through that in a, a way I felt was believable. Yeah. But, uh, so, yeah, my w- real-world task is uh, go look at Daredevil or... If you don't have access to Daredevil, um, give a new show a try that you think has something to add to your um, uh, your process of world building. Because I think that show, character-wise, has a lot to offer. And for non-character shows, if you want nature inspiration, the BBC has so many good documentaries right now. Mm. It's ridiculous. The Wildest Anything... Uh, it's like all the good documentaries are right now on Netflix I've been watching are all nature based and they're all from BBC. So they have a lot of really, and they have spy camera ones, which are really cool. And the tease for next episode will be part two of creating a fantasy culture for dragon. And in that episode, the major focus is really going to be on the history and evolution of how they go from this tribe to this culture that's sort of distinctive from all of the other tribes that they started off. Sort of their story of how they started to where they got. And as always, make sure to go to Garduel.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L.com for the show notes. It'll be under Podcasting, World Builders Anvil. That's a great place to get all of the information from the episode that you've just listened to and to see all the resources that we've talked about in this episode. Thanks for joining us in this episode of the World Builders Anvil. Please be sure to rate and review us in iTunes, and please help get the word out to your friends about our show. And join me, Jeffrey W. Ingram at Garduel.com to see the progress of my world and learn why I made the choices I did. And please contact me and let me know the topics you would love to hear in the future. Now strike while the myth rolls high.